unlike a product, there is no phase where we can do a blue foam model and paint it and do a focus group and test for human factors and all these other neat things, right? We just have to go do it. That's a struggle for a lot of organizations because people weren't kind of a sure bet before they go do something. Welcome to the Product Quest Podcast. Thanks again for joining us on our journey to better understand innovation and product strategy. My name is Scott Burleson, and joining me as always, my co-hosts Jan Vermouth and Jonathan Edwards. Today, we welcome our special guest, Patrick McGowan. Patrick is the CEO and founder of the Service Design Group, a firm that specializes in service innovation. He has well over two decades of experience first at IBM before launching his own firm. Patrick has a really interesting background, though, having graduated from design school at NC State, which is one of the more difficult bachelor programs to get into, at least here in North Carolina. And I'm very curious as to how he leverages that knowledge. We'll get into that here in a bit. The Service Design Group has an impressive list of clients across industrial, governmental, and biotech categories, just to name a few. But on a personal level, Patrick is engaging, funny, super smart, Just the person you want walking into your door when you're ready to upgrade your service game. And for today, he's walked into our door, and I have a lot of questions. So, Patrick, welcome to the Product Quest podcast. Hey, thanks, guys. Happy to be here. (laughs) We specialize in introductions, by the way. (laughs) Excellent introduction. It's one of the things we were, were known for. I'll, I'll buy it from you. So the next time someone <laughs> asks me for a bio, I'll replace my official bio with the one you guys wrote. <laughs> We've had more than one person mention that. Uh, but let's just let's jump right into it. So services, how did you originally develop your interest in service design? Pure luck. Pure luck. <laughs> so yeah, uh, mixed background. You mentioned kind of my undergraduate education was a traditional design degree. In today's terms, it would probably be something of a mix of a like a graphic design and an industrial design or product design degree. But at the time I was in school, we didn't have those delineations. It was kind of architecture or not. Uh, And I was on the or not side of the house and just stumbled into the enterprise software early on. And then two things happened that put me on the path to the the services uh, space that I'm in now. One is I I took a job somewhere along the way doing what I would now call service design or service architecture. So I was in a design function that was also kind of dabbling in business strategy. And we were building essentially managed outsourced services for other entities. So like mortgage processing, risk underwriting, you know, all of these business functions. And in today's terms, you would just tack as a service after it. And everyone would say, wow, that's so cool. (laughs) But we did it. And uh, I kind of just lived it. And I did, I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. And I don't see a lot of it happening at that time. Fast forward, the next stroke of luck was I did a number of projects in the early days of what we now all embraces software as a service, right? But this was pre-cloud. No one had come up with the good words for it. It was, you know, early web software. It was starting to be hosted and it was not being sold as an enterprise license anymore uh, and saw what was going on there. uh, And in parallel had made the choice to go back for an advanced degree. I did a MBA while I was working and there was one class in particular that uh, was like a global context of business, something like that. And the guy had just these really simple metrics that he would look at companies, you know, and uh, one of them was this kind of alternate ways to look at revenue generation per employee. And when I looked at some of the companies he looked at, it's like, you know, they're they're not really just hawking product, any of these companies. So add those three things together. And that was kind of the what put me on the path to say, well, if I was going to do my own thing, what would we do? So I had this design background. And it was kind of like, well, what would we design? Okay, I could create a design company at the time. This was 2011. 
you know, could have done web design, user experience design, software design, all these things that maybe would have been an easier company to build. Um, but I, I personally was, mm, that might be a little boring. So if we're going to do a design agency, what are we going to design? And just thought this idea of designing services and service-based businesses is where things are headed. So why not create a firm that specializes in that work? Yeah, that's very interesting. So how does your how does your design background how does how do you use that? How does that how do you leverage that into what into service design? Yeah, so to me, there's kind of this like classic part of a design background that I think is still alive and well. <laughs> I hope so, but it's around. I think there's some core skills around you know, actual production work, like visual production work, you know, like a lot of people can have good ideas, but how do you communicate ideas to others? And I think something that sets uh, the design function apart from others is the visual communication aspect, right? Not written, but visual. Uh, and in there is a, an implied notion of rather excellent storytelling, right? Because a uh, Good visuals tend to also be a very good story. So I'd say that at the end of the day, that's it. And, and under there, I'd say there's, you know, if you go back to even the Greeks, right, there's all this theory around composition, even like what makes something pleasing. Uh, and a lot of times it comes down to composition. You know, two people could you could give them the same set of artifacts and say, put this into a visual storyboard. And what sets those two things apart? It's going to be the composition. Uh, it, so I, I think those are the core skills that we lean on kind of on a daily basis in the service design work. I think where people scratch their heads sometimes is the things we're designing are it traditionally in the purview of, let's say, the traditional designer, right? Because we're, we're designing pieces of a business model. Um, which tend to fall more in your business consultant, uh, product management, marketing sphere, right? So it's kind of a Venn diagram of tr those traditional design skills I mentioned, but the things that get designed are non-design artifacts. Tell me more about what well, you mean by composition. What is that? Yes, it's so to me, composition is like the relationship between items on a in a space, let's say a canvas, but it could be a three-dimensional canvas. It's easier to think of it in, in two-dimensional canvas, right? So, you know, like what makes, yeah, so I'll stick with my example of give two people the exact same things, right? So I might give one of you or both of you the exact same um, body of text, right? A headline, a body of text, and an image, and some other pertinent information like a legal disclaimer and a footer. So this would be like a graphic design challenge. It's like, have at it, right? I could even get, tell you the, the font size and the font face and the colors. We could make it all exactly the same, right? So kind of remove the individual cre creativity and say, all you have to do is lay these items out in your fixed canvas, right? In this case, the difference between those two is going to be how you compose them on the canvas, lay them out. And, and are, they, one, are they, yeah, go ahead. Are there any, any rules you follow for uh, composition? I mean, I, I know about the, the, the rule of thirds, of course, which is, I think is the basic one. I think there's also this idea of having uh, an, um, an odd number of objects. So your eye can follow around, but I think those are the only two things I, I know. Would you have any tips for people who, who, who might, that, that they could use. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is back to like on the daily basis, right? That's where I say, and, and I'm not trying to trivialize because this is purely visual design, right? But when we get to our work, I'm convinced a lot of what sets it apart is these things. And I think some of it is learned over time, right guys. And then, so uh, John, the, your question's a, a good one, which is that how do we decompose it for people to follow? Um, there are, I mentioned the Greeks earlier, there, uh, there's a body of knowledge there that I'm not an expert in, but where there's all these like golden ratios and proportions that they studied and documented and it's mathematical, right? And it, wow, the, 
Does it work? Absolutely. I'd probably put an asterisk next to everything I say is uh, heavily bent towards uh, Western civilization sensibilities. Okay. So uh, because uh, concepts of layout, symmetry, balance, they, they do change when we go uh, west to east. I, I've seen that in in other jobs where I had teams that were um, like we had a design team in China and it it did not transfer. So that's my asterisk. Uh, everything I say, mm. we can safely apply North America, Europe, uh, South America, for sure. Or that's been my experience. So, yeah, there's these kind of golden ratios for layouts. And then there are, yeah, like feelings of symmetry, right? Um, and then honestly, guys, there's a lot of little details around just like pure alignment, you know, like when you left the line things versus middle aligned versus it, you know, and it, it's hard for me to say there's a, a rule you follow across the board, but it's in any given context or, or artifact that's being produced. There's usually a number of kind of little things like that, right? Well, let's play with the alignment here, play with the spacing, play with the relative ratio of sizes and it just makes a huge difference. Uh, but I think some of that's the craft learned over the years too, which is, mm. it's hard for me to just say, yeah, here's here's my checklist, right? Top 10, Five check steps them off to... and you're good. But maybe, <laughs> maybe there is a checklist like that under under the covers and we just haven't published it yet. <laughs> we were yeah, looking for the top of all three the hacks to be a service yeah. innovation expert in like 15 minutes. Is that exactly. it's not out there? Yeah, so. Align everything left and add as a service <laughs> next to the title, and you're good. Great, I I have a huge respect. I mean, that's that. I think I'm I'm super bad at this, right? All this visual stuff is. I think it, that's a huge challenge. But I've, I I I I found that super interesting that you mentioned this. So so in some say that kind of services are are they are different because they are intangible things, things you cannot see even or something like that. So how do you bring these? I found that super interesting that you bring these two aspects together, kind of the, the work of visual aspects and services, which from another perspective could be like, couldn't be further apart. So how, how, do, how, how does that, or do you don't believe that the services are intangible or, or how do you? How? Yeah, no, that, that's a good question. I'm, I thank you because it kind of up levels what I was talking about. So I think the point of why I mentioned those core skills, which is so I accept the I guess this is like the economics definition, like the, what's the big difference between products and goods versus services and its intangibility. And this is something that we teach people that that's the root cause of why services are hard. They're intangible. Um, our belief in service design is everything we need to do or should be doing is to make them as tangible as they're ever going to be. And mm -hmm. that's when these concepts of producing artifacts that are visually compelling and tell the story, that's why I call these core skills of service design. So, you know, okay. let's just yeah. take, for example, mm -hmm. we're going to create a new service, right? Well, yes, at the end of the day, no one will be able to go into the wild and take a picture of that service in its totality, right? You could take maybe pictures of the service happening at different touch points. But why should that excuse us from having to create the moral equivalent of a blueprint that an architect might create for a house or a CAD drawing that an industrial designer or engineer would create for any piece of machinery? We we should still be able to sketch the concept, right? Create multiple variations of our concept design at different levels of fidelity and build towards a final design that a team can hold in their hands and assess and, and react to. So I guess maybe somewhere in between, I agree that they're intangible, but I disagree with the notion that that we can't treat them like tangible objects when we're doing the design work. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think that makes a lot of sense. It's it's also, I mean, in some way, you have to make it tangible in one way or another. Especially, I mean, if you're working with other people, it visuals are are a great tool. But I, I always feel like like uh, it's a huge challenge to make a visual communicate the thing that you want it to communicate and not something else. So, so I think that's really a craft and, and, and a lot of experience that goes in there, which I, I just don't have. 
So and huge respect I, for that work. I also wanted to maybe just uh, dig in deep on something else you said, which I found um, is a topic I, that I, I was interested in at some point, which is uh, the connecting storytelling and visuals. You mentioned storytelling. For stories, uh, the most like you ask someone in the street what a story is i think most people will say it's something it that takes place in time with different events something like that along those lines um of course uh, an image is is a fixed object so so how can you tell a story with something that's that's fixed yeah so to, to i would agree with the kind of your person on the street uh, definition of a story it's something that takes place over time and and there's a usually an arc of some sort in the story, right? Also something the Greeks tend to study a lot yes. and, and master. So <laughs> I'd like say sto yeah, story storytelling for us maybe isn't that deep, right? Like we don't need a hero arc all the time and all these other concepts, but we do need to see something that plays out over time and space. Because I, I can't imagine a service in the world that doesn't play out over time and space. And to me, the simplest tool here is a storyboard, right? I mean, <laughs> they've been around forever, right? Uh, even the, I guess, cave people, right? The pictograms on the wall are essentially an early storyboard. And uh, and so we use storyboarding uh, heavily in our work. When Whenever we design a service back to making it tangible, we, we would say one of the key elements of a design service or service offering is it has to have a storyboard that articulates the consumption experience and the delivery experience at a minimum. And, and there's your story, right? Uh, yeah. Of it playing out over time. And just a, a detail, but could be interesting for some listening listeners and for myself, what, what kind of tool do you use for doing storyboards? Yeah, it, it depends, you know, on the person and the team member. I'm probably, uh, you know, what's the uh, old dog, new tricks type of stuff. I I, I was uh, a product of the early, early days of the Adobe suite, and I haven't really moved on. So I make heavy use of Adobe Illustrator still. Um, but why? Well, it's vector-based, so you can scale it up and down. You know, all the benefits of vector graphics still apply. Mm. Um, we print these things out often, you know, large format, like three feet by, by eight feet. So what one, one meter by th three meters, roughly, I know that's not a hundred percent accurate, but when we go to yeah. print, you know, it, it does well with that. I, there's probably other tools and tricks out there <laughs> that I just haven't kept up with, but I, Adobe Illustrator by and large is, is kind of the production engine that we would use sometimes I'm, I'm actually amazed at what google google drawing can do too there's a lot of stuff there but when it comes down to some of the yeah creating more custom graphics it's just easier for me at least to still use use illustrator uh sometimes we'll you know once you get a storyboard in place then you can you know sometimes we'll stitch things together in like a movie you know, there's times where we'll do, you know, like a frame by frame with a voiceover uh, that that's kind of context specific. You know, who who are we trying to excite and where are we in a project cycle? Um, but, yeah, probably if I had to pick 90 percent or greater, it's Illustrator gets fired up on a computer at some point. The idea of making the intangible tangible, uh, that sounds like to me, that's that's a core skill that your that your company has, and it's. I'll be honest, bef before we chatted even today, it was I didn't have a clear link between the designs, like design skills and the service design. But now that's just so obvious. Now that you, you lay it out, Jan and I are in a similar consulting field, and you know it's sort of a market research. And toward the end, you get to this point where you're trying to communicate what you've learned and. Uh, for speaking for myself, I can certainly benefit from more of these design skills. I might not be able to develop the actual drawing, but certainly it's funny. I have this, you have this list of things like these skills you want to learn. I've, I've got this list and, and one of them on one of them 
on my list is storytelling. And if you ask me what that is, I don't even know if I could tell you other than I just want to get better at communicating these intangible, like you do a project and you learn all, you're super excited about it because you've been immersed in this world. And now you're going to present to these executives that are, you know, have, you know, it's very ingrained opinions about things and, and may, you know, they haven't lived in that world you've lived in. And so communicating is quite a, quite a problem. So this, it's sort of this idea of making the intangible tangible, man, that could be, that'd be a good tagline. <laughs> that that yeah. would be good. Um, I would say Scott, that yeah. kind of a um, little bit of a side note, but that synthesis and distillation of research findings I think that's a whole other level of storytelling. I'd say me personally, that's, I think that's a career long, lifelong um, learning curve that you can never cease to get better at. I mean, I'm right. So I'd say we're pretty good at the storytelling and the visualization of a service offering concept. Right. Yeah. But then when we get into times where there is more research and synthesis, uh, right. And you're, getting to a so what or a recommendation right. where I'm always right. like, oh, if I could only get better at that, you know, <laughs> and it's like you keep chasing it. I'm yeah. definitely better. I'm sure you all are too than when you started your career. But I would just put a side note into your listeners that that's a whole other beast. And if you ever encounter people that are excellent at it, you should soak up as much as you can. <laughs> I mean, I'm amazed sometimes people look at, you know, a 10, 20 page, like super deep research. And they'll just like nail it with like a one liner. I was like, yeah. okay, yeah. good, good for you. So, um, yeah. but yeah, the, uh, on the tangibility of the service offering, that's probably something I'd offer to you all too, is our point of view on, on services is our definition of what is a service is it's an in market offering from a firm that performs a job or delivers an outcome at a level of value or expertise, the other party cannot create on their own. Okay. Mm -hmm. So with that definition, oh, I'm like, okay. you have to be able to design the thing and put it on yeah. a piece of paper or else what are we asking management to invest in? What, what resources are we asking for to try to prototype and build the thing, right? What, what is a customer saying yes to if you can't design it and put it on a piece of paper, wow. you know, but, but I think that's a, that hmm. there's other definitions of services out there that tend to be more like it's any activity we do that might benefit us or our customer. And we're kind of just like, yeah, I, I think that's ad hoc activities. <laughs> Some of those might should become a service the way I just defined the service. But I think that's just an important baseline for today's discussion that that's, that's where we draw the line. Right. And, um, you know, cause I've seen people say, Oh, our marketing is a service for our customers. It's like, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I'm, you know, that's when I like my intellectual depth shuts off. So that's, that's for <laughs> someone else to, to research and talk about. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, we're we're yeah. after creating these in-market offerings that perform a job or create a business outcome at a level of value expertise that the person procuring that service cannot get on their own. And then I think it's interesting. I love the precision in that definition. Yeah. And I realize you just repeated it. Would you mind repeating it? One, one, I, I love it. Would you repeat that once more? Yeah, and then you guys can listen to the recording and give me a consistent <laughs> <of a mantra. laughs> an, an in market offering yeah. from a firm yeah. that performs a job or creates mm -hmm. an outcome at a level of value or expertise that cannot be attained on their own. Very nice. Okay, I have right. a feeling you've said that a few Spending times charge. before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm pretty happy with that definition. It yeah. took a while to come, and then we've used it ever since. Um, yeah. And but if we dissect it, right, so it's an in-market offering. That means it has a name. Maybe it's trademarked, right? It's recognizable. You could go survey customers and say, tell us about. I mean, then it's behaving like a product in terms of its its market yeah. awareness and penetration. So it's an in-market offering from a firm. So 
someone's done it for a business reason. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm a capitalist to a fault on these topics, right? Yeah. Why, why else would you do it? It's not yeah. easy. So it's from a firm and then performs a job or creates a business outcome, right? You all might be better experts at the job side than me. We've I've heard that language here or there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've we've purposely lumped that together, right? But it's yeah. it's not doing loyalty or customer sat or smiley faces, right? So we say dollars over smiles, right? <laughs> so performs a job or creates an outcome. That's why the thing exists, right? Yeah. And yeah. then the last part of that at that val level of value or expertise that the procurer cannot create on their own. I think that's the final piece of the puzzle. Like why, why would, and, and we do mostly B2B work, right? Yeah. But I think mm -hmm. the same applies in B2C. Why would someone procure a, a service if any of what I just said wasn't true? They wouldn't. Right, right. yeah. Right, and I so really that know. definition holds up to like, like take simple, yeah. you know, B2C services are usually easier for people to quickly relate to. Take simple ones that have been around forever, right? Getting your hair cut, um, having your lawn taken care of, having a room in your house painted. All of these pass that test, right? And then you scale up to advanced services from B2B offerings where, you know, I'm, I'm not going to sell you an air compressor anymore. I'm going to sell you compressed air as a service, you know? None of those things work if they don't pass that definition that I just proposed. Yeah. I, I love the precision because everything in innovation can, I mean, it can just get real fuzzy and people just sling terms around. And I'm like, I don't even know what anybody's talking about. So I, I, I really appreciate, I, pre, I really appreciate a, a precision in terms. Um, you know, it's funny. One it's just recent example sort of comes to mind. We just, we, we did a universal vacation recently and my wife said, let's use a travel agency. We've never done that before. So if we booked a service for this and, you know, it was, it, but I'm not even sure why travel agencies exist anymore because it's so easy to go on whatever site and, you yeah. know, figure out what you want and, and sort of customize it. And now with the travel agency, the, the gal is communication going back and forth in email and you're waiting. Did you, did we hear from them? Did we hear from them? And it's like the, um, so th that's a, that's a case of where you might be able to predict an industry. Uh, it may not be around. Then again, maybe I'm just not in the uh, the target market for whoever still appreciate still appreciates that. But um, yeah. let me ask you. I know one one term that also you use uh, is servitization. Tell us a bit. Of, what's servitization? What does that mean? Yeah, sure. So I think that's one where we could probably find lots of differences of opinion out there on it. So. Yeah. I'd welcome people to do that. And and what I'd like to lump into this conversation is servitization and productization, because okay. I think there, there's an yeah. interesting dynamic here, right? Yeah. So to me, servitization is more of the idea, what we encourage. So there's some very rigid definitions out there, right? That it means one and one, only one thing. And I think a lot of people think it means, you know, it it's monthly subscription pricing and all these things that kind of cloud the picture, right? And, and so I'll start with saying, remove how something is priced and paid for from the equation, because that's just good old fashioned pricing tactics, right? And, and just because you collect a monthly payment or a recurring payment does not necessarily mean you have servitized. I mean, there have been leases around since the Middle Ages, right? Uh, yeah. So, right. But to me, servitization is about embracing like a services mindset. Right. That the the offerings we're going to put in market do something on behalf of our customers. Right. It, it performs a job or creates an outcome. And that's what we're selling. Right. But then you're on a servitization path to me. Right. And, and I don't care if you want to call that a product, call it a solution, call it a platform, call it a service. Doesn't matter to me. It's that mindset of. The thing that we're selling does something. It creates an outcome. It's right. It's it's you know the I'd say the, the it's almost easier to describe it in the reverse, right? That the traditional transactional model. I'm going to sell you something, Scott. Whether you deploy that thing, put it in use, and get a business result out of it, isn't my concern, right? 
I step over the wall there and say the deployment, putting that thing in use and guaranteeing you an outcome of why you purchased that thing in the first place, if that's the business game I'm entering, awesome. That That's how we describe servitization, right? And and how you price, package, and sell that thing could happen in any number of ways. It likely will have some type of recurring revenue model. <laughs> why Why wouldn't it, you know? But the there's other elements of servitization that I think a lot of people don't talk about, like uh, service level agreements and performance level agreements, right? As soon as I have skin in the game for the use, operation, and success of the thing, am I saying that? only Monday through Friday, nine to five? Is it 24 seven? Is it 99.999% uptime? If there's a failure, am I going to transparently communicate that to my clients and give them uh, some financial incentive? I mean, the layers and layers here, that's like, that's what we're talking about. But that's a services mindset, right? That that I'm going to um, behave in those ways. Okay. Um, yeah. And I'm happy to dive into any of those. And, and I'll just throw productization on the table too, because it's kind of a fun thing to play with, is we're rather convinced that in broad terms, if you're a heavy product stance today, right? Like the DNA of your company is, is just making and selling products. You likely should be considering a servitization trajectory, okay? And if the... The amusing part to me is if your company is heavily, heavily a services stance, like professional services company, et cetera, um, you likely should be considering a productization trajectory, right? And, yeah. and what does this all come down to? I think it comes down to really you need to just have more compelling offerings in market. And so if you're on the product side, how do you make your offering more compelling? Well, you round it out and you make it more complete. And that usually means elements of service, right? And if you're a service company and a lot of your routine activities are a little ad hoc, right? Harder to repeat. I mean, how do you get better? You need efficiencies of scale, margin, repeatability. So you need to box things up a little bit better. And you, you find yourself on a productization trajectory. Right. So it's it's just intriguing to me that I, but I think there's a lot of people out there that it's like it's one or the other, you know, and it's like we're going to fall on the sword. And if you're not doing servitization, like you're going to go die a terrible death as a business. I, I'm not so sure. I think it's a big gray space and it's really about this create a compelling offering. And based on where you are currently, it's a change in behavior and mindset to get you there. Two big things jumped to mind. When you said productize, I mean, me being in a service business, that's exactly what we say. We want to productize yeah. this thing we're delivering. What we really mean by that, we really mean making it a little more repeatable, you know, whether it's the artifacts we create or, you know, the presentations or even just checklists or just how can we remove the variability so we can, so everything's not an ad hoc. Well, here's just something I've never done before. How? Because that's to make it a little more repeatable. You just make more money that way, as opposed to having to fit and, pro and deliver more consistent results, as opposed to figuring it out. So it's funny that we use that term "product guys." We're really talking about making a service with that with that word. It, the other thing that comes to mind is you know in the in the jobs to be done space uh, with a little bit of immersion there. The the distinctions between product and service sort of fade away. They 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 become less interesting because you're you're more focused on the customer's problem and you're less interested, honestly, in sort of what this it's like the solution comes later, right? And so um I, I I find it like like very burdensome to say products and services. I feel like every time I I feel like I'm saying all these extra words. I, I like I just took 30 seconds off the end of my life from having to, to say it. Um, but anyway, fast, um, absolutely fascinating. Can I, can I, 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 I really like um, also this how you tie it back, how you tie servitization back to outcome or getting mm -hmm. kind of getting a job done. I think that is 
hugely important. I think sometimes we have that impression or I, I well, from the outside, that's my perspective from the outside, that that people believe, and that's going to sound a little bit mean, but that in servitization itself, making some, turning something into a serving, there is value. And I don't believe that. So just turning, for example, I don't know, mobility as a service or, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, um, furniture as a service and all these, and that in, in just to believe that something becomes a, a subscription, clothing as a, as a service, and it's just kind of a subscription model kind of thing, I think in that alone, there is no value. I, I can imagine that some kinds of value can be kind of provided in a better way when you do it as a service, but that's a completely different perspective than, than believing turning something into a service has any, any kind of value in itself. So I think that's, that's when you, when you got alluded to it. So it's whether it's a service or not, I think is a different question from how do we, how, how does it actually deliver value? And that very often, if, certain conditions are probably true is a service rather than, than, than a product or how do you, how would you, how do you see that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're spot on, right? We actually had a discussion with someone the other day. They have an interesting technology and product. I mean, it doesn't really matter what it is, but that's, Oh yeah. We were considering doing devices as a service. We think there's an opportunity there. So ask them to tell me more. And what they described to me was basically just doing, an operating lease model, right? A, a monthly pricing for the same offering. And that's the feedback I gave them. I guess if, if, if your buyers want to buy that way, sure. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't call that a device as a service business model. If, if we've changed nothing about the product and the promise to the customer or the capabilities that are being procured, all we've done is change the pricing. Back to my point, I could have done that with a with a wagon and a horse in the Middle Ages, right? Um, I, for me to if for it to be something more than there, there has to be more in that offer, and and at a minimum, we're probably talking about those like service level agreements, performance level agreements that I discuss. I like to propose that there must be an element of continuous improvement baked in, right? We. Okay. We, the service provider, will continually improve the mm -hmm. capabilities and performance of the thing. But that's economically why you should be willing to pay me a recurring fee or else you're just overpaying for the product you could have bought last year. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it makes no sense. So I think I have to give you a service level agreement, you know, uptime, uh, response times, et cetera, et cetera performance level agreements that go beyond product warranty. I have to demonstrate that I will continuously improve this thing. So your recurring payments are buying you improved capability over time. I think that's the, the yeah. minimum this or else. Yeah. It's just, wait, I'm renting clothes on a recurring basis. Like, I, okay, yeah. <laughs> maybe, yeah. maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think this is where, uh, yeah, yeah, people get confused on, I mean, the recurring payments is so attractive to people and the, of course. the financial market you, yeah. kind of gone crazy valuating companies, if right? And then I think yeah. people go like, well, I mean, that's all that's all that all the music streaming services did. It's like, no, that's where I disagree. There, There is that fundamental difference between mm -hmm. I buy CDs and I hold them and I pay a monthly or annual recurring fee and I get access to a yeah. limitless library that's continuously expanded. And there are, you know, implied promises of uptime and availability, et cetera, et cetera, right? They invest in getting new titles, new artists, new features, um, improving the, the quality of the sound, right? It, it, that's, I think, a simple consumer example that passes yeah. this test we're talking yeah. about versus if someone had just come along and said, hey, you can have your same music library, but you just pay me monthly. Well, over time, you would have yeah. overbought your collection of CDs yeah. by like 20 fold. It yeah. would it, no one would have taken that deal. So I think the same applies in business to business and advanced complex products and services if there has to be that economic basis there right but that's not to be confused with it's still okay 
and to do a good old fashioned, I've made a product. Would you yeah. like to buy it outright or would you like to finance it? There's, there's no, if that business model works for you, by all means, go for it. So do you prefer the, the old uh, Adobe model or the new one? So, you know, <laughs> Adobe, you mentioned Adobe. Uh, what's your take on that one? Yeah, I mean, that's, I think, a great case study of, uh, I think, some pricing genius in the background there, right? And, and a tipping point is, I, so I would say if I unpack Adobe, probably in the early days, it was not truly an as a service. It was we have shifted our stuff from you buy a license and you hold it and it's installed to it's now hosted on the cloud. Um, and they incentivized everyone to say yes to that. But basically anyone that used more than two pieces of software, it, on average, if you bought and held that software for about three years, it was a wash. So you, so everyone said yes. And I think I, I'm no expert on, but I think that's why they had the success in the very rapid conversion, you know, that everyone, I see everyone always cites this one of how quickly they move. Mm -hmm. I think it's just because it was a very shrewd pricing tactic, right? That what, <laughs> why wouldn't you? That said, I do think they passed the test over time of expanding that they, I mean, there's so many things in there now. I, I, I barely scratched the surface of it and I look at it and I say, well, yeah, I'm getting my value for it. If we've ever needed some other stuff, you know, we just crack into it and it's there. You know, they keep adding features that I'd say my firm underutilizes, but that's probably beside the point. Others probably do, right? Like they've added the cloud storage and other things. So it kind of keeps going and going. So I, I think they're a good, a decent representation of, of, of passing, passing. And I had a, a, another question. If, if I could, you've touched yeah. upon a few of these, um, of these topics, I, I believe, uh, but what would you say in your experience are the, where are the places that most of your clients fail in the service, uh, in, in the, in the designing of the service process? So, uh, what would be common places where people, the people, so I'm talking, I, I think I'm interested in the in the process when you're blueprinting the service or something, what would be typical points that people don't, uh, points of failure that people don't think about or that you've seen to be recurring across uh, different industries? Yeah, yeah, this is a great topic that we could keep unpacking. So I'll start with my big one because I did a, a presentation a few weeks or months ago at a conference. And, and one of the, the slides I put up that was the premise was that the number one failure is, is in monetization, right? And what we argued was that it was, it's a failure of imagination. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll start with that, that I think most firms that we work with where the design process gets challenged is when you get into, the, we're, get, we're creating something that's going to make money, right? Right. And every, there's still today very much, that's when people start walking back, you know, concepts like we can't charge for things we've done that we've always done in the past. Or, or I think it's a mix of that, honestly, and um, maybe a realization that the thing we said we could do that we're now in the middle of designing and considering taking the market, maybe it isn't as awesome as everyone thought it was. When, when you hold it up to these concepts, right? Like, uh, oh, wait, for it to be compelling, it would have to be available 99.99% of the time. We can't do that. Or, um, or, oh, for the service design to be compelling, it needs to guarantee an outcome. Ah, I mean, Scott's really smart and everything, and he's done a bunch of good projects, but I'm not sure we guarantee it. So th those tend to be be the friction points in the design process. But I think the root cause is, is we're solving for monetization, back to my service definition, right? So we're solving for something we're going to monetize. That root cause, I guess I'll call it, manifests itself constantly throughout the the design process. Okay. Um, does that make sense? 
I was going to ask, what, yeah, yeah. what is that root cause of the monetization problem? Is it because it doesn't deliver value or it's just it's not able to deliver on the promise you'd hoped for? Yeah, and this could be, you know, in, in projects we've done, yeah, a lot of times we're harvesting latent capabilities, right, mm -hmm. in an organization for this stuff. And there's often a belief that there are things which could be harvested and built up and scaled and monetized. And sometimes those things come face to face in the mirror with with the truth of what they are. And maybe uh, maybe it's not something that could exist globally or um, or performs as consistently as people would like to imagine when they were in their strategy phase. Right. Uh, dr dreaming it up. Um, yeah. I was going to say, too, there's a couple um, like more. So that's the big one to me is this like the monetiz the all of the dynamics around mon monetization like continually pop up during the design process as as kind of challenges right um i think some of the other ones that i'd say in the process right is we promote a process that says the only way we can truly design and launch a service is to go get it in market as quickly as possible, right? So quickly create a concept. And then what's the next step? The next step is to go deliver it with the first customer, right? Because this is back to that tangible, intangible. Unlike a product, there is no phase where we can do a blue foam model and paint it and do a focus group and test for human factors and all these other neat things, right? We just have to go do it. That's a struggle for a lot of organizations because people weren't kind of a sure bet before they go do something. Um, and then similarly, um, it, we promote the idea that, you know, you should mature this. The service design is something that we would mature over time. We call it a living lab. Just go do it, go do it, go do it. And that the commercial terms and the pricing are part of that puzzle where there's no way we would have it right from the beginning. So we should go and learn and refine as we go. That's a struggle for a lot of people because they're used to, you know, their spreadsheets for doing I costing and five pricing year on the product plan. and do a five year plan. It's like, Hey, maybe those people are out there that are that smart. Uh, I haven't met them. Uh, and I'm comfortable saying I'm not one, of, but that's a challenge. Um, and I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but the, 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 the final one I'll put on the table and then we can revisit them is this fallacy that it's going to be easy and that it should be wildly profitable from the get go. And it's I, I still can't fully explain. I mean, this we're talking very experienced, seasoned executives often. Right. And, and the scenario goes something like this. OK, we're going to do something with services and we've never done that. Right. And then this belief that it's going to be quicker to get to market than, than their product development pipeline, that it's going to somehow cost far less money, right? And produce revenue at a quicker scale than any product launch. And it's just like, why? why? Right? It's... <laughs> It's a net new thing you're trying to do. So that's probably the the uh, the biggest one in the design cycle is then facing this kind of almost unrealistic expectation that it's going to go super fast, make a whole lot of money right away. And it's just easy. It, after all, it's just a service. How hard can it be? <laughs> um, and and that, that's a challenge in the design process. I wrote down something you said a while ago, failure of imagination. And that comes to mind as you mentioned this thought that it should be easy. It's just a service. It's like there's no tooling. <laughs> you know, how hard can it be? Uh, and then um the, the expectation that it should be successful from the beginning. I want to go back to your description of what what I guess I'm calling prototyping. I don't know if it's the same words you use, but when you describe when you you just take a serve, you, you not just, but you you know, you have this service that you've designed and uh, you want to take it to one customer. So when, when you're doing that, do you, um, do you, dis do you uh, communicate with the customer? Hey, this is something brand new. What's, what is that process like of prototyping a service to that, to that initial customer? 
Yeah. yeah, that's that's our recommendation. So again, something that's hard for organizations sometimes. I think they end up seeing our logic, which is, and this is B two B. Again, yeah. I'll, I'll emphasize this. So in B two B, our belief is your customers are are like partners in this stuff. And yeah. why would you want to show up with a big lie, right? Yeah. Like, oh, we've got this new service, and we've we've got a thousand people on it, and it's awesome. And and you haven't done it. Bad idea. So we promote Scott showing up and being very transparent that you are patient zero, <laughs> right? right? We 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 see an opportunity. We believe in it. We're committed to it, and we think you dear customer, right? Out of all of our other potential customers are a perfect candidate to kind of grow and co-create this thing together and make commercial terms around that first offer that makes sense for both parties and include in there things like we may not continue with this. It's a very reasonable thing to do, right? Um, Put the value exchange in there and don't lose sleep over these crazy concepts that, oh, we might lose value on that contract over time. <laughs> Why? Right? If yeah. if some good customer of yours helps you co-create some service that then moves your combined market in a new direction, at losing value over time, right? But, yeah. if, but if you show up and pretend like you have this new offering that's fully baked at commercial scale and someone cuts you a big contract for it and then they learn that you haven't quite figured out how to resource it and and put the tooling behind it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's going to erode the value. So, yeah, but that's we always say like start with 1 to 3 customers, you know, 3 would be the ideal. Okay. Uh, it's got to be at least one though. Back to that idea. If the answer is zero, we should just stop the design process, right? So we need yeah. at least one. We call these living labs like I said to kind of Part of it is to, we could call them a prototype or a proof of concept, right? But what we've seen over the years is people, those existing terms just mean certain things to certain people. And so we kind of want to break the mindset a little bit and enforce we're doing something different. So that's why we've come up with this idea of a living lab um, to kind of put a boundary around this thing communicate that it is experimental. Um, it is hypothesis based, like a yeah. science experiment. We should know what we're testing for and what we're looking to learn. Right. And, and there's going to be multiples of them. <laughs> so like mm-hmm. living lab number one, and then two, three, four. And the goal would be that we are refining the design and hardening the commercial concept every time we move forward. Right. And reserving the right to end the thing if we see that it's not not making sense. You mentioned commercial terms sort of in in consistent with that. So I presume that means something less than you hope to earn later. Uh, Perhaps would would somebody even do that for free um, as under the guise of learning? Is that. Yeah. 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 So, I mean. Maybe, uh, Maybe. <laughs> uh hi- hypothetically, there'd be a case where you could get more for the first go than you ever will in the future. Ah. But, but I, I haven't seen that or pulled that off. Um, <laughs> we tend to encourage not doing straight for free. I yeah. think that's a bad idea, okay. right? So let's at least leverage this thing I'm calling a living lab for something. Maybe that's a contract extension or contract renewal on your existing product business. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's not for free, right? Right. You just got something out of it. Um, yeah, I'd say that's our de minimis is to go in there and at least get real commercial value in your existing business that matters, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then add in things, you know, like. Um, an ability to do a use case and marketing around it, press releases. I mean, it it is 2023. So a lot of times there's some data and other things that may be of value. So let's, let's put a data use and a data sharing agreement in the mix. Those things could have value. 
Um, ideally, you'd want to put some IP protection in place, right? That, hey, this is a thing that we reserve the right to further commercialize and take to other clients. There's value there. So, yeah. Um, so from my point of view, Scott, never for free, but yeah. let's not confuse that with that first delivery has its own unique price tag. Right. Mm -hmm. So with and, this with this living lab, how, what is different about it? I, I, I presume there would be something like you want to learn quickly, so you might want to sort of evaluate everything. How does how how does that work? I mean, do you have there's like a special team that's like looking at numbers, or or how how do how do we how do we make sure we learn as much as we can, as fast as we can from that initial go? Yeah, y yes to all of that, you know. Yeah. And then some of these, then it depends on what's the What's this service that we're, this nascent service that we're designing and testing? What's the context of use and yeah. where's it being deployed, right? Because sometimes learn really fast might be a nine month cycle yeah. to go, yeah. you know, hook up some new instruments, apply some data science, host some stuff in the cloud, make some process improvement changes on a production line somewhere, right? And prove that it's all working. Okay. That's not a two week sprint, you know, that that everyone was looking for. But we what we tend to do, Scott, is just depending on the scale of that thing, just break it down and say, you know, where at each kind of milestone that we could put in place, what do we need to what must be true or what are we trying to learn? And and then I mean, to me, this is true agile. Right. And then pivot and make changes accordingly. How, what structure do you use or how, how does a, how does a live, uh, do you use the word prototype or, or what, what word would you use? I don't think you use yeah, it. We use this living lab term. With living our, lab. Okay. Yeah. With, <laughs> I'd say experts in the space, I'd say it's not so different than the act of prototyping, right? Okay. I, I think with the important distinction that often prototypes mean, um, not a, commercial, probably usually. Yeah, yeah not yeah. and sometimes even non-functional, right? right? Functional right. and semi-functional right. representation of the thing which will be built, yeah. right? That's that's yeah. where this intangibility yeah. roots its head. And I mean, there's nothing for the to test or for the customer to react to if you don't try to deliver the service. Yeah, so sad. That's what we tell people. So sad, but literally, the next step is to go attempt to deliver the thing. There, there's no way to hear you. Yeah. How yeah. does it graduate from living lab to the next step? Is that is that formal? Do we just kind of run it a while? Do you have like a date in the future we're going to evaluate? Or how does that work? Yeah, that's a good question. We've dabbled over the years with trying to have, you know, kind of some construction software here, I guess even product, you know, with your uh with your alpha beta kind of stuff. Honestly, none of that's really stuck because it's so fluid, right? So we kind of just try to structure it as, again, there's there has to be a minimum of living lab number one. Yeah, and it's yeah. that ambiguity people struggle with, and yeah. and it's to some degree, let's see, trust the process, and let's see. What we know is we don't want to stay in living lab mode forever, but you could also argue that, well, yes, you do, because at the end of it, back to it, it is going to be a service at the end of the day, and it will be subject to continuous improvement and learning. So do you ever really exit living mm -hmm. lab? Not really, but we use that construct and do try to coach our clients from a point of it's to me, it's a scale up, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. OK, how many people are supporting this thing and how many clients and how many sellers are actively selling it? you want to see that growing over time. Right. And, yeah. you know, and moving from things like the first pitch to a customer to a generally available sales deck that any salesperson can access. Right. You want to see a milestone in the future where sales is carrying a quota for this new offering. Right. I mean, there's, yeah. there's the business machine has to kick in at some point for these things to succeed and grow. Um, but I think that that timeline there is the thing back to P 
people can underestimate that significantly, yeah. right? And uh, I, I, in your interactions between, so between you, the service design group, and your own clients, um, how do you organize the different roles and responsibilities? So the way I'm thinking about this is much of the what constitutes a service is precisely in in the different uh, in the service blueprinting, let's say, or the the process. Um, how much of a of a role do you take in designing that versus um, your clients? Uh, where is the limit between you doing their job and potentially, um, you know, entering into their area of expertise and do, going too far in that relationship? Maybe, yeah, potentially. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The analogy I like to use here, it's imperfect, but it's the best one we have so far, is to think of us as an as an architecture firm, right? Maybe an architecture firm with, with definitely design capability and some build capability, right? Um, and, and the reason I like this analogy is because if we think of, you know, anyone, you, you guys or your listeners, you, you have a house or you might want to have, right? You, chances are you might consider a remodel at some point, an addition, or tear down and build new, right? And you could do it all by yourself. Absolutely. DIY. Do it yourself. You <laughs> could line up other specialists, some cut subcontractors, you know, plumber, tile, have them do pieces and you do some pieces yourself, right? You could go with a builder or a general contractor, right, and get the job done. Or you could go with uh, someone who specializes in the design of these types of artifacts that will also drive the project forward, which is what the architect does. So we and we say, just replace everything I said about houses and remodels, additions, teardowns, and put service offering in there. And we're the architecture firm in that analogy, right? And then so what's our job there? It's the same as the architect. We should be the one producing the design blueprint. That's our expertise is the design of that thing. But that's not a vacuum, right? I mean, like a good architect's not just going to be like, oh, I've seen you. Here is your house design, right? Like no input from you whatsoever. It's highly collaborative as, as our work should be. But there's there's that skill and expertise you're paying for and probably – you would want the architect to make some judgment calls on your behalf and some firm recommendations. Yeah. So all that's why I like this analogy. It, that's all true for us. And then you'd want them there through the construction project and the kind of build out and the go live of your structure. And, and that's where we're going to participate too. I think that's the part where it's, it's more fluid. So on the design part, it's pretty clear. Like we are providing that design muscle. When you get into the production, the building, it, it's it's somewhat variable, um, you know. But I think in that space, I tend to think often, Scott and I have talked about this in the past too, that we're to, to some degree kind of an insourced or outsourced force multiplier for like a product management capability, right? Like that's, that's usually what I see missing is there's usually plenty of people that can kind of drive the stuff forward, but – the, that role of keeping the eye on the blueprint, right? That's the thing we're building, right? This is the thing we're testing. These are the commercial terms we're going after. This is the vision tends to be the role that we play the most with our clients during that phase. Okay. And how, how is it typically in the beginning? Like do, do clients come to you and say, Hey, we have a, kind of have a service idea or Hey, we have uh we want to build service X. How should we go about? It? So, what are kind of typical first first moments or first first contacts that you have with, with your clients? Yeah, this I'd say this is the recurring challenge for the service design group. Is that while I believe everything we're talking about today is somewhat intuitive and straightforward when you get into it, there's not a lot of, of people out there, at least that we're aware of, that are looking for this type of help or support, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we tend to spend more time than we'd like still on like education and, hey, ha have you thought about these things? Um, and I'm still amazed how many often sophisticated organizations are not looking 
to the opportunity in front of them around services to grow and expand revenue. I, I wish yeah. they were, right? I wish I wish every kind of PL owner in every B2B in the world was just given a clear mandate. Go, I think they have been, but how right? Go expand and grow revenue. And I think very few of them say, what are my options there? Oh, services are an option. Oh, yeah. I've, we've not done that before. Uh, just, you know, so can someone help us with that? But th- that's, that's not what's happening. So we tend to go uh, find people. And usually it, these days, maybe someone's talking about digital transformation, which is usually super vague. Yeah. They're talking about different business models, uh, different pricing, maybe about recurring revenue, all these very like kind of loose, unstructured thoughts. Or we have this new technology, it's killer, and we're going to launch it. Maybe you could tell us what you think about it. That These are mm-hmm. our kind of vague okay. entry points. And then we usually have to say something like, have you considered the this type of thinking? And, and it goes from there. Um, the only cases that are more direct for us are every once in a while, someone will uh, realize that they have a portfolio of services and it's yeah. grown unwieldy or is underperforming. And they'll say something very concrete, like, could you help us rationalize our service portfolio? It's like, yes. It's straightforward. Absolutely. But, <laughs> you know, but this is very rare that that happens. Uh, similarly, <laughs> Um, someone might realize they have an existing service that is struggling with like Mm -hmm. renewals, retention, or like margin performance. And they'll say, could you help us turn around this uh, flailing service? Yes, we would love to help you do that. But, uh, but those are kind of minor patterns, right? And so I think there's, there's all this business opportunity around, building better offerings. Let's call it that. Because I think some of the confusion is, what do we call it? But if we just simplified it and said, there's revenue growth opportunity everywhere for building better offerings, right? And if people realize that there is, I mean, this is always the risk of sounding self-serving as a consultant, but there's a reason external experts exist in all sorts of fields. It's the same reason why you use legal counsel and financial counsel. And there are specialists in things. So, right, there are specialists in exploring and finding other paths to revenue growth. And one of those happens to be service design. Mm -hmm. Have a look, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's just not, it's not there yet. But I like that as a frame because, because it kind of, other a, a thought or kind of way of thinking about services I often well often whatever that means I encounter sometimes is the idea that well you have a product and now what you could do is sprinkle a couple of services around it right and then that's usually something that's never been done that that okay yeah, yeah in a couple of years we've improved the product and so and then we can sprinkle around some services and usually they never get to that point where they actually so and i like how you frame this as a service as, as a thing in its own right right so kind of a, a, an offering in its own right just as you would when you go to a legal agency or cutting your getting your hair cut is a thing in its own right and i feel like that's sometimes it's underappreciated that a service is kind of well a product in its own right in a certain sense yep yeah and, and the sprinkle services is a uh, <laughs> we see that too Right. And that's I was like, what why if we're mm-hmm. talking about a complete compelling design, why would you ever sprinkle them later? Why <laughs> wouldn't you just include yeah. them from the beginning? Yeah. I agree. <laughs> I had a question regarding pricing. Um I, I having been myself in a in a service business, I, I found pricing one of the hardest parts of the the process, especially as there's a second, well, kind of an attribute of service design, which is both a blessing and a curse, is that it's it's fairly easy to add, you know, as you go along to add different capabilities, which you can't do on a product. On a product, you build it, and then basically, if you want to change it, it's it's hard. There's 
a temptation at least um i I'm, I'm sure you would disagree with the general approach but at least it's easy just to add on your website well we also do this or change how you do the service etc and so of course then the the pricing is impacted also to a certain extent um how do you think about pricing i've i've multiple questions are, that are related i'll just ask them and then you can uh, so how do you think about pricing um do you do you think there's a general rule that that you should go more with a cost base or value based pricing approach um and how do you deal with pricing if if you want to share that if you're willing to share that uh with your own clients how do you approach this pricing issue because it's a I imagine your projects are fairly difficult also to frame and define in 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 terms of the uh, the 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 hour, man hours that you you spend on them etc. So anyway, the, the question around pricing. Yeah, yeah. So let's start with the pricing of services for like our client work, right? I I feel like cost plus gets like this terrible rap, but but I feel like it's it's the minimum starting point. Right. So back to the intangibility, tangibility, we have to be able to take this service offering concept and get it in a blueprint at a minimum, which we do. Then you absolutely need to at least have a cost basis built up against that thing. Right? Like what what is the cost to deliver it at, at a minimum? Right. And then we at least need a basic kind of what will will people pay something that covers that cost and makes it margin positive right so but i'd say cost plus kind of thinking is the starting point right and then back to my definition of a service if we all agree that the thing we're designing and taking to markets going to perform a job or create a business outcome right um then we should be able to explore value based pricing right and revenue share or or value creation kind of percents right my experience is over time we land somewhere in the middle of those two right um doing just cost plus you're probably leaving money on the table um but if you think you're gonna go grab 30 percent of the revenue you created no right i mean like economics just kick in and, you know, so I think uh, by and large, we end up somewhere, somewhere in in between. And it just has to be a good, yeah, the value has to be there for the money. And that's why I mentioned this living lab model is we use pricing as one of the things we maintain as one of the agile components. Well, let's see. <laughs> let, let's see where it lands. And I mean, we've had projects where maybe in the first living lab, um the client we're working with they they take the hit and buy let's say the new sensors or inline equipment for doing some new optimization well, kind of makes sense in living lab number one right um but then we learn wow that thing really worked why not in living lab two why don't we just say hey you end customer you pay for that equipment and right okay that worked. Maybe in the next living lab, you say, "Hey, let's let's keep that cost in house and see if we can monetize it. Let's let's run that experiment, right? Can we put a package around that and try to get more than? Oh, well, may, maybe they see right through it and they say, "No, no, we'd rather. Wh why would we pay you more over time for this equipment that we could just go purchase ourselves?" So, so we learn something and we're honing in on on the final pricing model. Okay, so uh, ho hopefully that helps. Well, what I'll add to this too is there's a fallacy I think that comes from product pricing thinking, which is this idea, right? With products, usually you release a product, it has a price, and to your point, that product doesn't get new capability unless you retool your manufacturing line, and then it's a new release, and then you can change the price. But you rarely change the price on the thing that was released, uh, other than markdowns and discounts, right? Not true with services, right? Be be like you said, you, you can continually add to the service. So at any point, you do have an ability to revise pricing. And 
This is a hard thing for people to wrap their you, you mean we could raise price over time? Yeah. I see it happen every day in, in the consumer space. It happens like crazy. So I know long-winded answer to say we start with a cost price model and a value price model. Our assumption is we're going to be somewhere in the middle. And then we're back to don't worry about it. Keep it fluid, right? Don't lose money. And let's just build that thing. And I, I, I view it as like we're kind of approaching the apex of what the market will bear, right? And, and if you've been profitable from the get-go, because we knew what our cost model was, and if we've designed this thing appropriately, the margin's going to improve over time because that's part of the good design work. And I don't think there's much to worry about, right? So but hopefully yeah. that answers the question on client pricing. And then I'm happy to address our pricing too. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the obvious problem also with, well, I don't know if it's obvious, but with the um, value-based pricing is often in services specifically in B2B, the return on investment of what you've generated is often does is not so clear. So there's no often there's a kind of gap or space between the service you've pro, you've provided to your clients as a service provider and the how that impacts their own business. And so it makes it often quite difficult to estimate well what what is the value of what you've you've created in the end you know in a clear monetary terms yeah so, and, and, um, and sometimes and yeah this overreaching or belief that we created all of that upside for you I, I it's very rare that the thing your product or your service that you took to market to a b2b on its own created the full you know, leap and yield or output or throughput. It's, hmm. There's usually multiple players to your point. So that's why I feel like that value, you know, this thing is going to create a 2% yield increase and we're going to take X percent of that. It's never that simple because they, they no. usually are doing some other CapEx improvement project hmm. in parallel. They're exactly. retraining their people and there's eight other vendors doing other cool stuff. And you just have to accept that and come back to, we know what we created had value, right? It has a cost structure that looks like this and it's it's moving the needle for your business. Here's a fair price, you know? I mean, but yeah. And so just uh, would you share, for instance, so if you do a cost, uh, cost plus um, approach on your product and you would present this potentially to your while well, you present this to your clients you say well this is the cost plus this is the value based approach um why wouldn't they i mean typically the value based is higher than the the cost plus why wouldn't they just say well we want that <laughs> we want that one yeah. um uh, would you share that information with uh, a client or or uh, with your clients as they're working through with the lab uh the creative lab would would they is this information you would share with the, the 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 client of the service in question these different pricings yeah yeah i mean rarely have we with let's say a living lab recipient in my language given them uh pricing optionality right usually we've ran it as like an a b experiment or an a b c mm. where you're right big I think it's just less weird that way. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But mm. you could be on to something. It could be interesting to throw pricing optionality in the mix as, as a test and see what people respond to. Um, yeah, you know, as I think about this topic more too, what I can say is, and my comment earlier that people kind of like cost plus has this bad rap. Our experience with, with service design has been though that often what happens is people undervalue and forget a lot of things. So we spend a lot of time kind of layering on, well, look at all these other activities you're going to do and things you're going to like, let's, let's make sure we t understand the total package, the total service package, and let's assign value to every bit of those things. Hmm. Even, even if it's just brute force, what would it cost a client to do these things? Okay, we're, we're going to host some data in the cloud. 
could they do that? Maybe they can't even do it, right? Maybe they'd have to hire someone to do it and buy a whole IT infrastructure, right? Let's not forget that that's part of the offering. Um, you know, how back to the service level agreements, the guarantees, uh, you can layer more and more things on here that cut to me, that's, and I'm not a pricing expert, right? But I think it puts us somewhere between cost plus and value, right? Like there is no cost in my book to offer you a guarantee. But if I offer you a guarantee, I believe I can charge more, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I right? think the, just the simple, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think the exercise of going through this um, cost, so the exercise of performing a cost plus pricing forces you to actually really think in fact about the deep questions of your service and what is the value you're actually delivering at each, st each step of the way. And I think it's, it's also just a good um, a sanity check on your service and 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 maybe things that you can take out and uh, really just seeing where is the work going you know and how much it does cost in the end yeah, yeah. exactly that that's what i like about it and and for what it's worth i tend to not tell people it's cost plus we like we tell people like we need a unit economic uh model right that's how we so we do our service design and then we say okay Let's decompose this thing to all the moving pieces, right? And then let's build that back up to a unit economics model, right? So mm -hmm. if we sell one unit of that thing, what does that look like, right? So and then we start adding units over time, right, as we scale. I think that's what's important to understand is if we scale the service, is it scaling, is its cost structure scaling in a linear fashion, maybe we don't have a good design, right? Is, that's uh, is the yeah. cost structure scaling, you know, disproportionately lower to the revenue structure? Okay, interesting. We have a, that's what I call a unit economic model. We have um, good unit economics, let's move forward, right? Mm -hmm. But if, if we've somehow designed something that, Every time we add a new one, it's just like a stair step, right? I, maybe you're still making money, but it's not as attractive. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So you like to, as you as you as you add volume, the margin should increase. Is that? I think so. Yeah. I think that's a, it's a good premise or a good litmus test, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what's been fascinating with the, uh, you know. I would say the as a service businesses that get um, yeah. disproportionately valued by the street, it's because of this, these unit economic models are somewhat exponential. I'm no mathematician, right? right? right. Lowering marginal yeah. costs. <laughs> yeah, they are not linear. It's not a linear function. Yeah. It's some type yeah. of exponential function. So we, we should try to design things that behave that way. Yeah. It's better than the cost minus program, which I've I've experimented with at times. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll, I'll touch happens? real quick upon then our pricing. So I, I know I commented earlier around if you're if you're in the service business inherently, you might want to consider kind of a productization trajectory. That's exactly what we've we've done to ourselves. So we've service designed ourselves over the years. And ev everything we do has always been for a fixed price, right? So that's another, if we um, talk about premises of services, I think services should include transparent pricing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we've done that from day one. Pricing has always been transparent. People are going to get the same answer no matter what. Um, and fixed price, right? Uh because we should be delivering something to you, a value or an outcome, back to my definition. So we've taken uh, everything we do. This is probably what I spend a, a lot of the time on with the business is how do we take something that maybe another firm would have in kind of a black box consulting model, lots of hand waving, right? And it's essentially it's time and materials under the cover. Mm -hmm. so do not like that at all. We've taken and productized and created like sign signature artifacts for what we do. So like the act of creating a service offering concept 
we have an offering called the big picture, right? And we can give you a pro basically a product cut sheet on that thing that says, this is how it works, right? We have a two hour knowledge transfer session. Here's the type of people from your company we need in the room. We can do it 100% remote or we can do it in person. Within 10 business days, we come back with three to five drafts of a service offering concept. We have a one hour review and then we give you your service offering design. Here's the price. That, that's how that, and we call it the big picture, right? So then it passes my test Beautiful of- product. Sign it's me up. Product. I'm in. You're in. So, so, for, so for each stage <laughs> each stage of your process with your own clients, you, you have basically yep. a kind of package. Yes. And, and this package has a fixed price. Yep. And a, and a clear- yep. A uh, clear yeah, boundaries nice. around exactly what the engagement looks yeah. like, um, you know, the time frame, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, we have one at the upfront for kind of alignment and kickoff and strategy setting. We have this mm. one for ideating and blueprinting the service design. We have another one for rationalizing the service portfolio. We have another one for diagnosing an existing service and then creating the future version of the service. Um, and then the living, so the one that's the grayest, right? In terms of you can't put it into a, an exact box like I just did is when we enter these living labs, right? Yeah. The, the time frame of the living lab is highly dependent on the type of thing you're building and the complexity of it. But then we offer a fixed monthly price for us to play that, outsourced, you know, service manager, innovation manager role as part of the team on a fixed predictable monthly spend in like three to six month blocks. And we give an indication of, hey, for that service we designed, we're probably looking at six months before you're in a living lab or we're going to need a nine month living lab. So that's how we kind of solve for that one that's a little bit more open ended, but but it's still then passes the definition right of uh an in-market offering that does a thing. unit yeah yep. exactly so so, so that's somebody, how you talk for it yeah sorry. if somebody wants to learn more about service design are there any resources or books that you recommend you know i'm a i'm not a super intellectual guy myself in terms <laughs> of reading a lot so i never have great recommendations for people um you know I, there are on the pure design side of the house, let's say, right? There is a book called uh, This is Service Design Thinking or something like that. I think it's a decent yeah. intro read. Um, there's also a design network, service design network, uh, originally out of Germany, but they're pretty active globally. That if someone wanted to kind of check things out from a pure design side, I'd say go down that path. Um, on the, the business side of the house, right? I, I almost point people more towards, you know, go read as much as you can about business models, right? Business model canvas, um, business model thinking, business model transformation. Cause I think that's, so it's really like, which function are you coming from? Right. I also would suggest um, guys that there's a, this kind of design part that underpins a lot of this work. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a lot of good stuff out there now, self-paced courses, um, you know, certificate programs around human centered design and design thinking that I don't think would hurt, <laughs> hurt people yeah. to, to yeah. go do. But then it's the come. I think that's the, for me, it's the combination of these things that is where the magic's at. And mm -hmm. um, I guess my main caution is I do think there's a lot of stuff out there that sounds like service design that for me is more like experience design. And, and right. that's okay. That's okay too. But I think it's very different to approach an existing service or service business and improve the experience of that service than it is to help a company create an in-market offering that's going to create a job or an outcome right and produce revenue right that's that's a skill set that i think draws from 
product management, product marketing, right. you know, design, business strategy, pricing. So there's a lot that you really truly have to get under your belt. Um, and, and that's why I always hesitate to say, oh yeah, there's this book, go read it. Um, yeah. But hopefully that gives people some paths that they can say, oh yeah, I kind of know about that thing. It's just to the left of right or right of where I currently am. Go get started there. Um, and then I, what I also tell people is just start like critically looking at, you know, when you see stuff in the news, when, mm-hmm. when you see some company that just crushed it with some quarterly revenue performance, look at them and have a look at what do you think's really going on, right? Mm-hmm. And did they just sell a boatload more product or did they mm-hmm. introduce some new services? Like yeah. what's going on? And, you know, is a company that you might think is a tech company, for example, might you start looking at them as a service provider instead? And I I feel like that's where the best learnings for folks that I've kind of coached and talked to over the years. It's more about kind of think about these concepts, embrace them a bit, and then just go like actively learn from what you see in the trade news and my premise is you will start seeing that a lot of the things you didn't used to think about as a services story are in fact a services story (laughs) and they're just not presented as such Hmm. well let's talk about how folks can find you uh one they can certainly find you on linkedin it's patrick mcgowan m-c-g-o-w-a-n or the service design group.com. It's just like it sounds, the service design group.com. Easy enough. Any anywhere else uh, you like for people to find you? That's really it, Scott. We've yeah. uh yeah, LinkedIn, LinkedIn and the direct direct to the website are the best options. No Instagram or Twitch or no. <laughs> <anything like> <laughs> <that>. <laughs> awesome. Well, we just have one one final question, okay. We're gonna have a new. We're gonna we're gonna host a new uh, conference on servitization. Okay, we're gonna have people from all over the world to learn about servitization, and as part of the festivities, we're gonna all watch a movie together. It can either be for entertainment or for learning or for whatever you want, but you get to pick what it is. What what movie are we watching together and why? Wow, wow, this is a <laughs> a very interesting question for me. That's I'm the toughest you know, one of them all. <laughs> yeah, all of all of the movies, man. I <laughs> movies watching movies has been a you know pastime of mine for, and it comes and goes. It's in waves, and I'm currently on a down wave just because everything's been busy uh, with work and family and everything else. So you know, I'm I'm rapidly searching through my brain to try to pick something that would just make you know, no sense in all sense, all at the same time. <laughs> um, and it's, and, and I'm struggling with that. I'm struggling with that. But, uh, Hmm. Yeah. I'm going to go non-committal on this one for a, for a movie. Maybe I'd watch everyone. I'll go with something that's been present of mine lately. The 1986 world cup highlights, just cause oh. they were awesome. <laughs> wow. They were awesome. How about that? Excellent. Excellent. Very good. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. Very Didn't good. See that yeah. coming. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. The um the Blues Brothers. For some reason I have sensed we're you, this Blues Brothers or Animal House, um, but but we will go with the highlights. Okay, yeah. very good. <laughs> Not even uh, a movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very innovative, right? You yeah. know, you you don't you don't suffer from this failure of imagination you referred to a while ago. Yeah. All right. Well, so good. I tell you what. One of the things I really appreciated about our talk today is um, this idea in innovation in general, but also services of all this fuzziness, fuzziness, and even this terms of mm. like, you know, bu- you know, business model innovation. It's like, what does that really mean? Or, you know, digital yeah. transformation. But I love that you have this very precise definition of, uh, of servitization. And um, that, anyway, that's something I personally appreciate quite a bit. But anyway, thanks so much for uh, spending some time with us today, Patrick. I know I've learned a lot in my... My friends here have, have as well. I'm quite sure. Yeah. 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 Thanks for having me, guys. The time flew by. Excellent questions, and uh, happy to.
continue the discussion at any time. Yeah, maybe we'll have part two, part two down, part two down the road. Part Next time, we'll, yeah, anyway, we'll have part two. And that, friends, concludes today's Product Quest podcast. Follow us on LinkedIn. Reach out to us anytime at productquestpodcast at gmail.com. And we will see you next time. I like how you're, you're super efficient in, uh, in your thinking. Uh, just straightforward, really, really yeah.